Yeah, geographers, how you doing? Um, so I'm recording this. It's January what sixteenth, twenty twenty two. By now, you've seen the announcements that we are, uh, yeah, we're remote once again. Antelope Valley College, yeah, this whole thing. This is fantastic. Um, yeah, so we had one week of the spring semester. Just enough time to be in person to realize that half the students were already sick with COVID anyway, and to pretty much get a big chunk of the other half uh, who showed up to campus infected with the disease. Go figure, right? But say la vie. Here we are. So, for now, those of you geography students listening to this, again, the, I gave you the date. It's the spring 2022 semester. Week two of the semester, officially, as I record this, will be remote, meaning that we're doing this, you know, on the internet, virtually. We're all safe at home or whatever. That's a whole thing I won't even get into. Um, but that's the idea. Um, now the idea is we would throw together a zoom meeting and I would just, you know, hold class in that way. I, I don't do it that way. Uh, mainly because when we get to this point where we are, uh, um, you know, remote in this way, it, it means society is, is collapsing and it's difficult for people to function in this way and to treat the semester like it's all the same stuff. So I want to give you a little more flexibility, put a little more uh, agency in your hands so that you're able to get through class material when it works for you. Whether that is the typical class meeting time, you know, during the week, or if it's at some different time. Doesn't matter to me. As long as you just, you know, continue to work through this stuff and, and we'll keep working on assignments and tests and all that good stuff and we'll we'll learn some useful stuff. All right, and as I said, it's just week two of the semester is officially remote. But then again, that was kind of what we did two years ago back in the spring of 2020 semester when we first, you know, heard about this stuff and, and we decided, okay, we're going to, go remote just for a little bit see what happens and well here we are now right so I'll keep you posted with what's going on but in the meantime as we wait for our our dear leaders to in their infinite wisdom decide what's best for us um I'm gonna finish up this was the lecture I started in class last uh week um and we got to about here in fact if I go back yeah we talked about all this this good stuff and part of our big epistemology and how we approach the world and truth and all that lecture we finished up with these ideas. Now, I want to get into this term culture, since it is a cultural geography class. Uh, and, and we'll talk about what that is, because that's a that's a very, very loaded term. Um, I have this quote. Here to start with, Raymond Williams uh, writes in his book, Keywords, one of the two or three most complicated words in the English language, which I, I don't have any argument with. I do love, he doesn't get into what the other, you know, one or two um, complicated words are. Just kind of leaves that for you. Um, but yeah, culture is, it's, it's complex. What, um, what it means, and it's complex because so many people have interpreted it in different ways. It comes from different things. And based on Raymond or uh, Williams' uh, uh, work, um, it's a case where where we if we look at the Latin roots here, cultura, it's a it's a, a metaphor that we're doing here, right? We're talking about farming, growing things. We're cultivating crops, right? It's the idea that through culture. It's like plant food. It's like being taken care of. We're going to grow to beautiful, uh, wonderful, brilliant uh, human beings if we get the right culture. And that's a very Victorian way of looking at this. I have Jane Austen here. That's the figure I always use to, uh, you know, describe this idea of there are there are proper things you do when you 
read and you learn this. So we have high culture versus low culture. And so if you take in enough good culture, you learn to play the piano, you learn to speak a foreign language, you watch the opera or ballet or something like that, you're going to be a good person. All right? You can kind of think of it as having nutritious food versus junk food. If you put in this type of food into your body, you're strong, you're healthy, you're wonderful. You put in this, this other stuff, this junk stuff, uh, well then you're not going to grow, you're not going to be healthy, you're not going to be strong, and, and all of that. All right? So that's, that's still, it's very outdated. We, we tend to not think this way, at least academically, we don't. But so many of us, I think, still fall into this trap of this is good, this is bad. I mean, and you can see this, too. If you have, like, some TV show or, or something that you like to, you know, watch, um, or, you know, even if there's, like, a, some social media platform that you like to scroll through and be on and post on and, and all of that, um, but you're kind of embarrassed by it, right? Because you feel like, oh, if people knew that I'm, I'm messing with this junk, they'd think less of me or, or something along those lines. We want to avoid that. We want to embrace the idea of multiple types of, of culture, yeah, okay? And that there's no good or bad culture or, or things like that, all right? Now, some of this, I mean, we can predate the Jane Austen stuff and, and some of the ways we think about it. Uh, Herder here, German philosopher, um, and this is coming from, you know, this is what Raymond Williams is kind of talking about. He points this out. The quote is, is from... Keywords uh, saying nothing is more indeterminate than this word, referencing culture, and nothing more deceptive than its application to all nations and periods. And so this is not so much looking at our individual like cultural intake, but just this broader idea of culture, grouping it to a group of people or a nation, all right, or a moment in time, as he's saying here. But what, what Herder was arguing for was, let's talk about cultures in the plural, right? Let's, let's not look at one superior culture and inferior ones. And, and this is, uh, um, you know, in part, this was Herder, a German, basically fighting against the British and the French and these other, you know, Europeans who viewed themselves as being superior to, say, the Germans and the Germans kind of fighting back and saying, you know, to hell with you. We're cool too, right? That's kind of what he's what he's getting at. But it, it's useful, even if it's kind of selfish on his own uh, um, part here. It's useful to think about this: that whether we are dealing with personal, you know, culture that we consume, media or whatever it might be, you know, junk TV shows versus prestige television, right? Or we're talking about you know, the people of this country are superior to another uh, country. Regardless of what we're talking about, we want to think of a, a plurality of cultures. There are multiple cultures out there. Whether they're good or bad, you know, who is to say? Uh, that's kind of the idea here, right? And also getting at, well, we'll get into this when I get into Boaz in a moment. But also the idea that, you know, just because one culture seems to be more advanced, more brilliant, whatever it might be, uh, it doesn't mean that other groups are kind of working toward eventually achieving what that culture has achieved, right? It's not like there's some end goal or some progress, some end culture we want to have, okay? So that's Herder. And you'll see, I mean, with a lot of this, this is kind of frustrating, and but it's, it's you know, it's also, it explains why... We never make uh, uh, much progress here. But you see these, these debates are brought up and rehashed year after year in different time periods. Okay? Franz Boas, he's, he's thought of as an anthropologist. Technically, he did geographic work as well. You know, at least geographers will argue. And, and some of these definitions are, are distinctions, I should say, between which discipline a, a certain person belonged to prior to you know modern times it, it's kind of stupid because we didn't have some of these rigid disciplines uh, like we we have today but Boaz pretty cool cat uh because he was okay this is early 20th century stuff uh he and he laid the groundwork for anthropology especially to become what it is but just the general study 
of culture in a 20th century kind of way, Boaz was uh, you know, leading the charge. And so he, he came up with two ideas that are worth mentioning here. The first is cultural relativism. Okay? And so it's saying that cultures, right, and going back to kind of broader, not just the individual person, but cultures of different groups, whether it's countries or ethnic groups or whatever it might be, the reason why we have these different cultures, it's because, well, these cultures came to be in totally different places. They had different historical contexts and uh, conditions. They had different social things that took place. The geography, the actual physical geography, say, right? The nature and environment in which this stuff came to be it was different. And so that's why this culture does this thing and this culture does that other thing. But the key thing here what Boaz was getting at is that because of this, you know, one culture is superior to another. And, and that said, we shouldn't judge other cultures. That's the idea with cultural relativism. Cultures are equal, can't be compared, we can't rank them and all of that. We should just kind of, you know, accept them for what they are within their context. And this is a case where, I mean, you'll see this, I'll bring this up. Yeah, this is one of these cases where, I don't know, I'd rather, uh, I'd rather be in the classroom right now because I, I like to, you know, open this up to students and, and say, you know, first off, what do we think, All right? And so I'll say this, and you can pause the video as you're watching this if you want to play along at home. Um, you can pause it and think. Would you pause it? Okay, good. I don't know why I paused because I don't, you, you pause it, so it's fine. Uh, but most students, maybe you thought this would be, yeah, that sounds cool, right? You don't want to say, no, that sounds bad because it makes it sound like a Nazi, basically, right? Uh, but then I'll kind of push a little bit. And I'll say, oh, wait, wait a second. Is this totally cool? Is it ever okay to judge another culture? And what, wind, what winds up uh, um, coming up in some way, usually we get to, Women in the Middle East, all right? That's always a thing. Because we can say that in different Muslim, Arab uh, cultures, Persian cultures, different, different groups around the greater Middle East or just the Muslim world in general, we tend to think of women as not having equal rights with the men, right? This was a big deal. Early on in the 21st century, after 9-11, going into Iraq and then eventually, and, and well, Afghanistan first. Um, Afghanistan was really pushed as a, like it was a war that, yeah, we were doing because of 9-11 connections with Afghanistan, terrorism and all that. But also, look at how they're treating women. Right. Uh, that was and, and people from you know, Democrats, Republicans, all sorts of different people were pointing to this and saying this is disgusting. Now, the Taliban specifically, um, you know, not just Islam in general as a religion, but like a specific group. And there was there was dancing around this stuff, but but trying to get at like, look, we owe it to the women of Afghanistan, of the, the larger region that we think of as the Middle East you know, whatever that actually means, uh, we, we need to go in to help these women, right? And and this is the thing, again, we think about it, you know, it's it's kind of hard. And there are some images, like there was a Time Magazine cover, this image of a woman whose face was badly, you know, scarred. I can't remember exactly. I think like her husband threw acid at her face or did something burned her or something uh, along those lines and and just you know horrific the the violence committed against this this woman and and uh, you know you can't look at that and, and not go like oh be disgusted by it so in that case you know maybe it is okay to judge a culture in which this this happens right where this can happen um but then that gets problematic and this is why I bring it up, just to get us thinking about it and always be thinking about it. But let's say we start judging this other culture. That can lead into, um, I don't know, blindly moving forward. I mean, hell, that could lead to a 20-year war in a region, right? Which really didn't help women, from what I can tell, at all. Uh, one very enlightening thing for me 
being a non-Muslim, um, you know, white guy from the United States and all that, was in graduate school taking a seminar on Islam and the geography of it as well as the, um, you know, cultural and, and uh, religious aspects and, and all of that. And in this class, I was, well, we had, I think there were all together three of us who were not Muslim, did not practice Islam, not connected in that way. And and on top of that, weren't even from, you know, the region where most of the other students in the class were, you know, from Saudi Arabia, Jordan, places like that. Um, you know, so taking this class and it was so enlightening to, to, and that's what I wanted. I wanted to learn more about this culture and, and learn what I didn't know and how these people were, you know, viewed their own culture because that's the big thing is we, it's very easy especially as friends americans to sit back judge everybody but what do the people themselves actually think and what i found especially from like the different women from saudi arabia which we think of as being horribly barbaric in its treatment of women they're like what the hell is your problem why are you guys so obsessed with whether we can drive or not especially when you don't even have gender equality with all our pay gap stuff and and things like that uh and you know to be perfectly honest there was no good rebuttal in fact even there, for one week in the class i remember looking up data for some presentation i was giving in the in the class and and looking at you know women's rights in the united states versus saudi arabia and when you looked at it based on the data it wasn't that radically different when it came to education, when it came to, you know, participation in government and stuff like that, uh, Saudi Arabia was doing better than the United States. So our women could drive, yes, but when it came to actually getting educated, Saudi Arabia was better off, right? Now, you know, it's, it's one of those things. Like the driving thing, as Americans, we think of that as like, that's, that's one of our, our God-given rights to be able to drive a car. The the Saudi women themselves were saying, like, I don't care about driving at all. They, that seemed like such a non-issue. And it also makes me wonder about um, public transportation and the way you can move around Saudi Arabia and, and all that. And granted, you know, the, the women I was speaking to, small group, uh, definitely these were, were uh, uh, privileged Saudi women who were able to leave the country come get an education in the United States and, and all that stuff. But still, it was very enlightening to, to get a sense. Like we we in the United States tend to have this this, you know, we're we're superheroes. We we go in and we save people. Uh in in fact there's uh, uh Gayatri Spivak, who's a post colonial theorist, uh has a great line. What is it? It's it's white men saving brown women from brown men. That's that's the approach that she quite often sees, where it's the idea that white folks in, in the United States, and it doesn't even have to be totally white, it's just kind of like dominant American thought, is that our country needs to go in and save poor women from these savage men who don't know how to treat them properly and, and all that, right? That, that clearly doesn't perfectly work all the time because of our own issues here so so with all this all this rambling that i'm doing the point is we should keep cultural relativism in mind that cultures yes they arise out of their own material conditions right that's why they are unique that's why they are different that's a cool thing by the way and so no we shouldn't pit them against each other saying this one's superior these others are inferior but at the same time it's totally okay to say, hey, this culture, that's, that's pretty harsh, what they're doing, how they're treat, treating this group, or how, what they believe in here, what they do here, you know, practices, whatever it might be. But at the same time, still, while we can judge, we should do so in a much more nuanced and intellectual way and actually get and talk to the people and try to understand what's going on rather than just say, hey, this is different, therefore I don't like it. You dig? Hopefully that makes sense. I don't know. I'm like I'm already exhausted. Uh, recording all this stuff from my different classes and all that. I could be rambling. Apologies, um, but you know, there you go. Uh, okay, so that's that's cultural relativism. 
Then we also have historical particularism. Still Boaz, still thinking about cultures, but he just, he gets, and it ties into this, that these cultures have a unique history. Therefore, we can't just assume that because, you know, that, that if, if this culture, culture A, whatever it is, um, you know, progressed in a certain way and got to where it is today, and it seems to be really good and successful and fantastic, we can't assume that culture B just has to follow those steps and it'll get to that same point, right? And this is a, this is something that even after Boaz has been talking about this, you know, I'm in a, the United States and Western Europe, no one ever got this message. It's And we'll learn about this when we get into development and globalization and, and trying to get, you know, poor countries less poor and all that. Typically what's utilized is saying, well, hey, the United States, we're super wealthy. We got there this way. Why don't you guys just do this? All right. But shocker, it never works when we try to impose that. And there are a whole variety of reasons. But according to Boaz, the reason he would point to is that, well, yeah, it's a different culture. It's a totally different situation. So we can't have this one size fits all approach to cultures around the world. All right. We got to think about what's unique in this place. Uh, and, and so that's something we'll, we'll continue to see and, and think about. And especially when we get into the, the last part of the course, when we get into how culture, you know, or how, I'm sorry, how countries, you know, have gotten wealthy and have stayed poor and, and all that stuff. All right. You know, another figure worth discussing is Carl Sauer. And, and a lot of, it's kind of thing. We'll, we'll very rarely will I uh, directly invoke Sauer's work here. But, but pretty much everything I'm talking about that's just like kind of pure cultural geography, it's rooted in the kind of stuff that, that he did. Um, so very influential in making American cultural geography what it is today. It's changed a little here and there as we'll see, um, you know, as we move forward. But, but uh, you know, the big thing, one of the big things that he gave to us is the idea that when we're studying culture, it's not just, you know, the people themselves, what the people are doing or what they're talking about or any of that. But it's place, it's it's space, it's where things are taking place. And if we if we look at it and we really think about this and if we train ourselves, what we can do is is what's known as reading the landscape, right? The idea that we can look at the world around us and, and through carefully training our, our, you know, our mind works and what we're looking for and, and all of that stuff, we can get a sense of what a place's culture is based on, you know, what, what's there or what isn't there or whatever. And it's kind of maybe abstract at this point. We'll get some, you know, explicit examples of this stuff. Uh, if we were in person, we'd, we'd typically be in, you know, the UAZ Hall building in our, our classroom. We talk about that building. I, I, sure, I think I mentioned to you, you know, when stuff wasn't working, how it's the $60 million building, but we talk about it, you know, think about what is this building itself? Forget about the people that are in there, but just that building, what does that tell us about a, the culture of, of AVC, right, of the college itself, or just community colleges in California, or just education in the United States, or whatever. That's what we'd get to. One thing I would point out, and I mean, again, you can pause and think, reflect, right, on, uh, um, you know, what it is you're, you're uh, um, whatever I'm, I'm talking about. But but one thing I would point out, and just thinking about the building, what is I would ask, you know, what does this what does this building look like? Anybody know what this is supposed to be? And again, talking about you Hazy Hall at ABC. And nobody ever gets it. Um, I, I I was told early on, so that's how, how I know this, but um, the building is supposed to be a spaceship. You aware of that? Yeah, think about that next time you're on campus and check it out. But all of you Hazy Hall, it's supposed to be not just a spaceship. But the the Star Trek, the the Enterprise, right? A specific one. Apparently, the architect, she is something of a Trekkie and liked the idea of trying to make 
the enterprise come to life, you know, here on Earth. That was the goal. That's what we're stuck with. Turns out, and, and you can look at it, too. I mean, you can see, like, when you walk down the halls and there are just those lights in the walls and everything is kind of illuminated and glowing. It's like a spaceship that you see on a TV show or whatever. It's got that feeling. Nothing, also, everything's kind of round. Nothing actually meets at a 90-degree angle in this damn building, which, A, is why it, it costs a lot of money because they had to custom fit everything at weird you know, 86 degree angles or, or things like that, but it has this round shape. And again, it's supposed to look spacey, but you know, really what it, it winds up doing is it just makes, it's the most uninviting uh, uh, building on campus right now for human activity. I mean, I mean it's amazing how, how unhuman friendly that building is, but it, it sure does look nice, at least when you know, stuff is working uh, and, and all of that. Um, but that's the thing, is just looking at the building. What does that mean to, to invest that much money? Number one, to make something kind of spaceshipy. Like, what is that telling about how we view, and, and you know, no shocker, it's the science and math building, the STEM building. You know, what does that say about our culture and how we view this stuff? And the idea that we would have, you know, make-believe science fiction stuff connected to it and, and so on. That would be reading the landscape. Thinking about the actual buildings, the, the layouts of stuff, the places and spaces. What does that say about our culture? So something to think about. And, and that's what Carl Sauer really gave to us and others have, have taken this up. And this is a lot of what we do today. Uh oh, look at this guy. You heard about this guy? Bad guy alert. Bad guy alert, right, Americans? All right, so Karl Marx, number one, not a geographer. Number two, never really spoke about culture, like some of these other individuals, anyway. Um, but, well, basically, everything he talked about, so worth continuing to talk about today. That's why I bring up Marx here. Uh, and just to be aware, the whole idea, I mean, me growing up, of course, I'm an old man. So I grew up where when technically the Soviet Union still existed, we still had the Cold War, and the idea of communists, that was scary, and they were evil and, and all of that. So I remember in elementary school, just hearing about how bad Karl Marx was, how bad communists were. I don't know what you guys get today. What's it like? Um, but there's still plenty of people I, I run into, even, you know, academics and all that, who just look at somebody like Karl Marx and they think, oh, gross. Uh, and it's just awful. We have with the whole critical race theory thing that we've been uh, um, you know, briefly, like we've been talking about. We've hardly had class yet, but but I, I started to talk about it. A lot of that. It's, it's people use the term cultural Marxism, which I'm just so you know, that term cultural Marxism, it's rooted in anti-Semitism, by the way. That, that tended to mean Jews I don't like, is what people meant by cultural Marxism. So, you know, take that uh, however you will, um, right there. But there's this concern that the Marxists are going to destroy society and, and all this stuff. And what you find is a lot of people who are freaked out about Marx, I've never actually read any of his books, any of his works, uh, or, or don't even really understand what it was he was talking about. And here's the deal. You don't have to want to be a full-on communist to benefit from what Marx is writing about, right? It's uh, He was brilliant in his analysis of what capitalism is and just economics in general. I mean, that's a big thing. And he also gave us tools um, to study not only you know economics but just the world around us right so he's incredibly useful not anybody we should be afraid of but of course you know the other thing is a lot of his own conclusions were capitalism's bad you know class hierarchy is bad his, his whole idea of communism with you know with frederick engels and that uh, duo when they wrote the communist manifesto it was the idea to totally change society and, and that'll kind of we'll talk economics and industry later we'll talk about you know modern capitalism versus communism and socialism and all these different isms that we we have um so some people just don't like him mainly because you know he 
was against how these people profit and, uh, you know, make a lot of money and, and stuff like that. Um, but the main thing with Marx, what he was saying, was that that life itself, it's rooted in economics. Like everything is economics. That's, that's where we begin and end all of our study. And also, he was big on the idea of struggle, conflict, battle, tension, all, all kinds of stuff there, right? For, you know, struggle for dominance and control and, and that kind of stuff. I mean, that's the general idea here. Um, now, what, or at least that's how people, I'm not, look, we're not going to dwell on it too much. I'm just anticipating like all sorts of Marxists going like nonsense, but okay, let's move on. The key thing, what I want to point out primarily now, we'll come back to Marx later on, um, but it's this base superstructure model, okay? This is a fundamental thing of when people are thinking in a Marxist way or Marxian approach here, it's to address both the base and the superstructure, okay? Uh, and I have, I think I, I stole this from Wikipedia somewhere out in the world, but this is a diagram that I think is useful for conceptualizing what's going on. So the base in the blue down at the bottom there, uh, we have this term means of production. We'll talk about that, but that's that's economics at its its core form here. So you can see tools, machines, factories, land, raw materials. This is the stuff we use to make other stuff. Right. Or to just survive, to be able to, um, you know, function. I mean, that's that's a big thing. It's this this struggle for survival that we need to, you know, take things from nature and use it for food or shelter, or some of that basic stuff. Right. So that's our base right here. We get into relations, getting into, you know, how we we deal with these resources and the means of production and all that stuff, all right? So that's what we got at the base. Now the superstructure, this red thing, very clearly says everything not directly to do with production. So, you know, for Marx, it's all that it's this economic thing, right? But we have other stuff. I mean, one, one thing people can say, like you say everything is all based in economics, but you know, what about works of Art. What about things like love? What about, you know, my religious beliefs and, and that kind of stuff, right? That's, that has nothing to do with capitalism or money or production or whatever, right? What Marx would say, and Marxists would say, is, oh, oh it's not directly connected, but what's going on with the base is influencing, you know, all this other stuff within the superstructure, right? And what we've got going on here, and this is all too, I should say, like it's, it, this is stuff that has been continued to be worked on and uh, um, fleshed out and all that by other people long after Marx was, was dead. And something that's still discussed and debated and, and you know, conceived of today, this is something I love to, to work in. You can see in the middle, of superstructure, ideology, um, something again we'll talk about, but that's something I, I work on quite a bit. I'm fascinated by it and how it's all connected and all that. We'll, we'll get to that. Don't worry, geographers. Um, but it's the idea, right? So going back to this, this whole base superstructure idea, it's a what we would call a dialectical relationship. Okay, um, and at the bottom they're saying this moves in a spiral pattern, but it's it's the idea that there's not a direct, you know, A leading to B kind of thing. There's not some causal relationship. It's this back and forth that's going on. The base influences the superstructure, which in turn re, you know influences the base, which will come back and do this. It's a constant back and forth. Everything is connected. But the key thing, right, is the idea that capitalism in, and I'm, I'm speaking in, you know, for American society, even though we all have these different backgrounds and, and all of that in this class, um, that we're 
at Antelope Valley College in Southern California, in the United States of America, like that, that uh, places us within capitalism as this dominant, it's definitely the whole, you know, form of economics and our means of production and relations and all that. It's rooted in capitalism, right? Whether you love it or hate it or whatever, that's what we got. Um, and the idea is, this is what Marx was getting at, and it's what I subscribe to, is that that cannot help but influence how we approach everything else. And we'll see examples of this. We'll come back to it. Um, but this is really important, I think, for understanding modern life. And I'll give examples of that. And it doesn't mean you don't have to, uh, you know, have, like, like, accept what Marx was saying. And also, that does, that's like, it's not going to turn you into a communist, right? If you agree with this, I'm like, don't worry. Um, yeah, you can you can take from what what this guy uh, um, gave us and still, you know, go forth and, and profit and drive a fancy car and, and that kind of stuff. All right. But we'll, we'll come back as again, as I said, we'll come back to this stuff a lot because it's useful in understanding culture. OK, as we as, as we're interested in it. All right. Now, moving forward, we're going to get a little more a little more modern. I mean, Foucault here, he died in, in uh, the 1980s. But still, um, um, we're, yeah, we're, we're trying to leave things, you know, the, the past things, this kind of formative stuff, and get into some newer things. And so this isn't like new, new, but this is stuff that is, again, relevant to what we're doing and something that, that you don't always get maybe in a, a cultural geography class. So Michel Foucault, French philosopher, working rough from the 1960s to the 1980s, wrote a lot of books, fantastic books, just, you know, all cards on the table. I love this guy's work. The, the you know, the, the things he produced, the ideas he had, just amazing. And, and really, you know, influential to me as I was going through school and trying to figure out how the world works and, and all that stuff. Um, but the, the key thing, that Foucault is known for us is power, knowledge, connection. Okay. And the idea, and, and you can see here, I have truth again in quotation marks. I, I've mentioned that before. We are talking about epistemology and, and all that. All right? But what he's saying, it's not just that it's subjective, that some people, you know, might believe this and others believe some other thing. But he's saying that truth is actually produced, right, by people with power and that continued production of truth is what continues to channel power it allows certain groups to use power to hold on to it to wield it uh and to you know therefore have a lot of influence on society and how things work and and initially he starts out looking at i mean he looks at a whole host of areas where this um is uh, uh is happening Right. And uh, um, but he, he looks at, at the sciences, institutions, these areas where knowledge gets produced, whether it's the medical field, biological sciences, just, you know, just kind of like like sciences in the enlightenment um, and after as, as just a way to study the world. Right. And where we might take that as like, well, it's science. It's there's no emotion or weird you know coercive nature or anything like that with this stuff it's just it's science right but he is looking at it like no this is where science comes from and because it comes from this this one area the way we study the world it's it's a very focused thing and therefore you know the way we get knowledge that was produced with a specific thing in mind and that's allowed certain people to you know utilize power and relations of power in society and it gets pretty i mean it's a complex thing i'm trying to, to whip through uh, uh some of this stuff and again it's one of these deals where we'll come back to it um and, and get examples of, of foucault's work amongst other people but it's the idea that this knowledge is produced uh and we also have this term subjectivity where he's referring to actual subjects okay where we're talking about you know, not just as being people, it's individuals and, and all of that, but subjects, meaning we, we uh, um, you know, are under the control. Like think of, you know, the, the king, 
and his subjects, right? That idea that we have this some kind of power structure in our society. And this changes at any given you know time in different countries and, and stuff like that. Um, but we have this power in place. And so we behave based on that. All right? He really challenges the notion of free will, which a lot of people don't like. Um, this stuff where we think like, oh, I make all my decisions and I do what I do. Is that who I am? He's saying we've been shaped to act a certain way based on this whole power knowledge connection. My favorite book of his is Discipline and Punish. It's on prisons. And, and he's really looking at, you know, we go back to kind of medieval style prisons and, and torture, and it's just brutal. I mean, the first part of the book, the first handful of pages, is just describing how this guy, um, uh, just getting, you know, like, tortured and ripped apart and all this stuff. I mean, it's a great, it's a great philosophy book. Not, not a lot of them start with uh, people getting ripped apart right there, but he gets into that and then he contrasts that with modern prisons where people aren't supposed to get touched at all, right? You go into prison, but you're not tortured in the prison. It's a different thing. But he looks at it and is challenging this idea of modern prisons being more humane. He's challenging the idea that this new form of a prison, the not getting tortured thing, and that's actually better, or it shows progress that we are getting better as people, less violent and stuff like that. He goes in and, and points out how prisons today are awful. And he gets into how it's not just the prison itself, but he looks at schools and, and other institutions and, and seeing how we're all trained our bodies, what he calls docile bodies, we're all kind of trained to be subjects in this new modern system. Right? And it gets dark. And again, people don't like it. It's kind of like the Matrix in the sense that, uh, um, you know, the movie, The Matrix, uh, in the sense that you have such little control, really, over what you're doing that there are these outside forces at work. People don't like that. I think that's why a lot of people don't like Foucault himself. And while there are, there are things that, you know, areas where he thought weren't important that that I, you know, agree with some other scholars and think May, maybe some of this other stuff is important, like ideology itself. So an example, it's still nonetheless, it's fascinating to see his work and to see how this works, right? Uh, I think I've got, yeah, I've got this quote. I'm not going to read the whole thing but i think i have in here um yeah field of knowledge well here okay i should get a new quote actually but uh i mean one one key thing right is the idea if you, if you read through this um it's just it's knowledge it's this idea of the, the power to define something we'll come back to that we're going to talk about chinatown and Kay anderson's work on Vancouver's Chinatown and, and getting into that stuff. But just being a group that's able to define, you know, in that case, what it meant to be Chinese. Uh, in this case, it might be what it means to be, you know, a prisoner, a convict, some criminal uh, of some kind or, or whatever. That's a powerful thing, right? To be able to decide what this knowledge is. Okay, so this whole we should admit power produces knowledge that's a key thing one thing this doesn't really get into enough which is why i think i should redo this find a new quote that's that's better here but but one thing is the the normalizing of all this that's a a, a key factor that you know foucault is is showing how this works through repetitive motion and how we're trained in school and, and stuff like that um it makes everything normal and it makes us think of things as being common sense. It's just, this is natural. This is how things work. Of course you go to school this way. Of course we have bad people in society. We need to lock them up this way. That's, that's the thing. One thing he wrote on himself, being a gay man, uh, but the idea of homosexuality. You know, there's this idea of like, of course being gay is weird, deviant, oh, you know, unholy, that kind of stuff. But he went through 
with Izzy he has a, a handful of books called The History of Sexuality, Volume 1, Volume 2, and, and so on. But, but one key thing he wanted to look at was just this idea of being gay. Was it always like this? And and no, it wasn't. It's very, you know, very much a part of society itself. Yet the real power comes from, you know, the knowledge that is taken as common sense. That is taken as, of course, it's this way. Because it hasn't always been this way. But if you poke, if you dig around, if you start uncovering it, you realize, oh no. No, it hasn't always been this way. No, this is just how we are. This is our present moment in time. This is how we are as a society. Hey, that's a very powerful thing that he gave to us and something we'll, again, continue to use. All right, now Dorian Massey. Another, this, and now finally, here we have a brilliant person who also happens to be a geographer. Right, I, I tend to... You're kind of depressed when I'm all my favorite thinkers. They're they're not geographers. They do something else. But Massey uh, was was a geographer and super brilliant. Right, two things uh, in one here. And so what she did, and what we'll do is she really challenged how we think of space. And we're gonna get into um, space and and place and that stuff. I think in the next lecture <coughs> is. Um, We'll be talking about that. We'll be defining this stuff. But she was very, very good in in uh, in the you know nineties, going on to the early two thousands. In two thousand five, she wrote a book for space, which is just brilliant. Um, short book, not necessarily the easiest read, but just brilliant. And in, in all the stuff that's in here, and and one big thing. Is she criticizes how philosophers have fixated so much on time, not so much on space. And in part, some of that's a, a definitional thing. Sometimes they talk about time in a way that we kind of think of space. It's, oh, it's a whole deal. We're not going to worry about it. But still, she brings up a good point that we kind of, we lose sight. And so what's happening right now at this very moment on the planet, because we're so fixated on like this telling of you know, A to B to C, kind of linear progress. Again, another big quote here. Um, not going to read the whole thing, um, but the, the idea, like when we get into where she says, for instance, here, a few lines down, we are uh, often using a terminology of we are developed countries. The countries behind us, as it were, are developing and then you've got underdeveloped countries, okay? And what that means, that we'll get into these terms, but developed means wealthy, okay? The United States is a developed country. We got a lot of money. Not everybody here is rich or whatever, but compared to everybody else, there's a lot of wealth here. Most people have it pretty good compared to other places, right? Developing would be a country that's still considered, you know, it's not in the developed category it's not you know great britain or france or japan or germany or, or these but it's it's getting there all right china it, it occupies this weird space where yeah they've got a lot of money and all that but they've also got issues that that has economists kind of place them into this developing or industrializing country so they're getting there they're they're approaching our level right and then underdeveloped means the poor countries Right, a place like Haiti, uh, or you know, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, or you know, wherever. Pick your your poor nation. Okay, but what she's she's getting at here is we frame this, but it's always in this this sense that it's um, you know, the poor countries are trying to catch up. Right, uh, it's saying that the country over there, back to Massey's quote here. Let's say it's Argentina. A developing country isn't a country at the same moment, which is different, but it's a country which is following our historical path to become a developed country like us. So in a sense, we're denying the simultaneity, the most multiplicity of space that I want to insist on, and turning all those differences into a single historical traje trajectory. Kind of gets back into that whole... Boaz notion of, you know, historical particularism and cultural relativism and all of that. 
what she's really getting at in not thinking more spatially about what's happening at this moment, we, we turn everything into this single history that everybody's trying to get to a, a present moment. And we're there. Like we exist in the future and everybody else exists in the past. And maybe they'll get to the future with us, but it'll be after we did. And, you know, you can see it gets all confusing and weird. All right. So space, we'll get back to that more. And But this is really helpful when we're thinking about other uh, uh, nations that are out there. Okay, a few more of these uh, uh, important figures figures and their, their concepts and, and how we'll, we'll use them. Just want to kind of introduce some stuff. Right, that's the whole point of this. And then as we continue on, I'll, I'll refer back to these different people. Um, but but so this this uh, cat right here, Homie Baba, is a post-colonial theorist. Uh, and post-colonial meaning like after we had colonies in a play, you know, like like India was a colony of Britain, and and we have this throughout throughout the southern hemisphere, eastern hemisphere. A lot of nations that were, were not independent nations, but were, were territories, colonies of some other larger imperial nation, right? After World War I and World War II, we see, we see independence in places. And so post-colonialism is a study of, well, what's going on? How do these countries, you know, still operate? I mean, a big thing is, is the idea with, with these countries suddenly being free, independent nations, one would think they would be able to, uh, um, you know, be successful and be wealthy and become developed countries and, and all this stuff. And it isn't always the case. And so post-colonial studies will look at why is that. And, and one thing that we find is simply this whole idea of colonialism uh, going away. It hasn't really gone away. We'll talk about that, too, when we get into just how the global economy works. But that's just post-colonialism. But one idea that Baba has offered that I think is useful is this idea of hybridity. Okay, and this is this is something this exists in kind of different forms. I'm just gonna go with Baba's uh, um, idea, mainly because you know I read one of his books and my God, it's so hard. The guy, bless his heart, not my favorite writer. Um, oh, it's a challenge. He's actually won an award or two about like worst academic writer and just how convoluted stuff can be how difficult uh, it can be. But nonetheless, this idea of hybridity, it's worth mentioning. And it's this idea that we go through life thinking about this, this binary of self versus other, right? I am myself. Other people exist outside of me, but it's, uh, you're, uh, it's either me or it's somebody else, right? I identify in this specific way as myself, right? And there are other folks. But he's saying that no single person is just this single subject, right? Like the idea of race, right? Uh, I'm a white person. I'm a black person. I'm, you know, Latino, whatever it might be. Nobody's just that, right? Because you can, you can have that race, but there's also economic class, right? I'm a poor white person. I'm a wealthy black person, right? That changes, stuff in there and that means that you actually you have uh, um well you're gonna think differently about stuff right that if you are you know white and black then and, and every racial and ethnic issue that we have in the country um you know that's something right but then the idea of of money that's gonna change stuff like you see white people who say racism forget about it like white supremacy oh i'd love some because i'm sure i'm white but I'm poor as hell, right? I live in this crappy house. My car doesn't run. I, you know, have a terrible job and all that. There's no such thing as white supremacy, right? And look at these black people who have more money than me. If this were a racist country, why do they have all this money, right? That's that's something one could say, and that's the thing. What what Bob is getting at with hybridity, right? Regardless of how you feel about a little hypothetical I just went through, um, people approach issues in the world based on a whole number of different identities that are kind of working within us, right? Race, class, gender, sexuality, right? All of that stuff. And we quite often, we use shorthand 
I do it all the time. I'm guilty of it. Um, but we'll say something like white, right? And really it's shorthand for typically white, um, but also male, typically middle class to wealthy, heterosexual, you know, there are a whole list of things that that are, are you know, ticked off with this, this just saying white, just invoking it in this kind of way, right? What Baba wants us to do is think about this, all the nuances in here, and see how this affects um, different people, right? One thing he uses an example in his book about um, uh, labor struggles and, and like unions fighting for better working conditions. And, and he gives the example of with coal miners, um, in Britain, you have it's a it's a white working class movement, but you have people of color who are also in that union and who are also uh, uh, women, right? There's a, a gender thing there where where uh, it's kind of male oriented, but you have these people within the union who had other issues, but it becomes this negotiation of what's important. How do we move forward? I mean, this is a big political issue when you have so many different people all these hybrid subjects people with a variety of different interests and, and experiences and things like that how do you move forward toward a common goal how do we make the world better for everybody when everybody is so different right just again something to think about okay and then finally in terms of people um Stuart hall Oh, brilliant. Just like Foucault. Another one who's like a huge influence on me and my work. Um, Stuart Hall, not a geographer. A, a, um, he really helped found this, this uh, kind of interdisciplinary thing known as cultural studies. Um, and it's really, it's studying culture, right? but doing so in a very political um, and social justice minded kind of way. Right? And, and doing it before, you know, again, this is like end of the 20th century stuff, early uh, 21st century stuff, before we had terms like social justice warrior and all that. Like the, the cultural studies people were woke before woke was a thing, right? And, and you know, for what it's it's worth. For, for some people, that's a cool thing. Other people, you're rolling your eyes, whatever. But that was the idea, right? We're going to study culture. And we're going to see how does that connect to social justice, political movements, economics, all, all sorts of things. And one thing, too, that these folks did is they looked at media, whether it's the news media, how we get our information, something Stuart Hall did. Um, but it's also things like TV shows, movies, music, stuff like that. This, this group made it possible for people to study you know, pop culture stuff, stuff that we would think of as being, you know, kind of low culture, going back to that whole cultura idea. We can look at the junk food, and actually if we study that, there's a lot in there that we can learn about our own culture, right? So that's what he did, and the whole, it goes back to Marx and Bass and super, superstructure and all that. It's how does media influence us, right? Or even control us, or can we utilize it? All right? Can we take like the news media and, and figure out how this works and actually use it to resist, you know, forms of power and, and things like that? There's a lot of cool stuff in what Stuart Hall did. And we'll get, we'll get into media at some point. We'll discuss it and we'll, we'll touch on some of this just a little bit. All right. So those are those theorists. And then quickly just go through the remainder of this lecture. It's all about just, you know, again, getting to the idea of what is culture. And so I have like the ballet, ballet uh, image there on the left. You know, that's that high culture kind of thing. The idea that uh, you go to the ballet and you watch a ballet and, and in doing so you will be a better person if you do that. Right? I don't know if any of you are ballet fans. I've seen one ballet in my life. It was this Russian ballet. Um... Oh, I, oh, it did not. I did not grow at all. What I learned is I don't like ballet. It was uh, it was Sleeping Beauty, right? Uh, and it was the longest thing I've ever sat through. Like like Beauty woke up, right? And we still had an hour and a half of dancing left to go. I mean, it was 
awful. But I didn't say that at the time because I was trying to impress people I was with. I'm like, oh, this is fascinating. Um, but, but that's the idea, right? That we have to have these cultural experiences to grow as a person. Now, I'm glad I, you know, I saw it. I, I have this experience. Um, but you get what I'm saying, you know, hopefully. It doesn't necessarily, you, you go to the ballet and you're a better person or a smarter person or anything like that. It's just, it's just one form of culture. Right. So we want to think about that. This whole high versus low culture. Right. You go to the ballet or you go to some professional wrestling match. Like, honestly, either of those, you can get the, you can get the same out of either. You can either hate either of those things or you can watch it and you can you could learn something about yourself or you can have a good time or whatever. Right. But we don't want to get fixated on what's good culture and what's bad culture. And in keeping with that. We also have this idea of exotic culture. Quite often students uh, in Southern California will say, oh, I don't have a culture. I live in the suburbs. I just, you know, I go to the mall, I eat at McDonald's or Chick-fil-A or whatever. And I, you know, blah, 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 blah. But these people, these people in this foreign place look different from me. Yeah, now they've got culture, right? Wrong. No, no, we don't want this. This is the anthropologist sense of what culture is and isn't and, and all that. We don't want to fall into this trap, right? But but we see this. And this is what like a, a magazine like National Geographic has spent decades doing. It's presenting exotic cultures of the world and, and making that something that's cultural, right? Whereas what we're doing in our own homes is it's not cultural. It's And it kind of... What it, what it winds up doing, kind of the evil part of this, is it's like we don't have culture, we just are, you know, correct. Like this is just the way you live, right? It's, it becomes, not directly, but the, the problem with it is that it kind of makes the idea of having a culture, these people, these other people, foreign people who have what we think of as culture, it's kind of like, isn't that cute? that they still have culture in that way. But if you're a real modern human being, you live in the suburbs and you go to the mall and you know, all that stuff, right? Again, don't want to fall into that trap. Everybody has culture. These cultures are just different. We can also have uh, subcultures exist. So you have a dominant culture and then you have a, another one, you know, or a handful of, of smaller cultures within that one. And so this picture here, I asked my students, you know, what do we see here? What do these these rainbow flags mean? Most students are able to say, okay, it's it's gay pride, LGBT, something along those lines. What these these flags are symbolizing is that hey, this is uh, this is an area where gay people of all you know the whole I say gay is, is shorthand for you know the whole LGBT. Q, I, A, plus, you know, and so on. These different non-mainstream sexualities, you're safe in a place like this, right? Because this is where, where people who belong to this subculture, right? You would say the dominant culture in the United States would be heterosexuality, right? Men and women uh, liking one another and reproducing and having kids and, and all that stuff. That's the big culture. But the subculture of the people who, for whatever reason, you know, you can get into the nature uh, versus nurture debate kind of stuff. Are you born this way? Is it a choice or, or whatever? And there's a whole debate uh, about that stuff. Well, we're not going to get into it uh, in here. Um, but it's a place where whatever, if you identify one of these non-dominant sexualities, you come to a place where you got these flags, it's a way of saying... You're okay here. You can be who you are. You're safe, like-minded people, and all of that, right? And and this whole idea, I mean, there's nothing here, at least from what I can tell in looking at this, but there's nothing here that says, uh, you know, gay, right? Gay people welcome, or anything like that. There are signs instead, right? Um, the flags themselves that... Uh, um, you know, it's something we have to decode. It's something that our own culture, even if you're not part of this subculture, right? Like I'm not a member of the LGBT community, but I can look at uh, um, you know these rainbow flags. Like okay, I get what's I get what's going on here. 
right? I, I can I can read this, I can decode this. And that's part of, of just culture in general, that we can identify certain signs, symbols, and stuff like that. And, and, and you know, that's how we get through the world, all right? That's how we can, we can function in this way. Our culture is doing some work for us or helping us make sense of the world around us. All right, another thing that culture is is that it's uh, learned similarities, okay? Um, we, we behave, we might be all different people, right, in this class, those of you listening to this, but we have a lot of similar stuff, whether it's traditions, uh, the language we speak, you know, the beliefs in general, values we hold, and again, they, they might differ to a certain extent, but, you know, if you're an American student in Southern California, there are going to be a lot of similarities there, right? As opposed to if you are, you know, taking this same class, but in, you know, I, I don't know, Tokyo Community College, right? Uh, or the Punjab Community College or, or whatever it might be. Um, you know, the, the, the whole culture thing is it's, it's something we share in terms of what's going on in our heads. And we get that through family. More and more, we get that through a classroom settings though uh as well and and uh our peers too non-family members but you know like the kids we go to school with our friends and and all of that this is why so many people freak out about what's being taught in schools because the concern is this is where culture happens where it's reproduced and and all of that and that's not fully true but it kind of is true and and so that's a complicated deal but that's that's a key thing that we're going to look into. It's also technology, right? And that can be, you know, past more primitive technologies. When we're studying an ancient culture, we look at the tools they have. That tells us something. You know, we also, what we have today, the, the cultures that we have, how we use them and stuff like that. Smartphones are amazing because they really, they, they, we, we are able to hold all of the world's knowledge in our pockets um and and you know pull it out whenever we need it and extract stuff and all that you would think we would be brilliant we'd be the best humans to ever exist you know but here we are here we are learning remotely um at least in part because we can't agree with what's the best way to deal with a virus whether we should get vaccines or not whether we should invest in you know better infrastructure and a whole host of things what is a lockdown do we give money to people to stay home? All of that stuff. Like we're still fighting and, and battling stuff out and we have differing ideas, even though we have this incredible technology, you know, at our disposal right here, right? So it's interesting what it tells us um, and, and what we also, you know, don't do, even though we have this technology. But that's a big part of studying culture. Hey, art is something on the left what do we have there? What is it? Who painted that? Is that Picasso right there? I think so. Pretty sure. I Googled Picasso. I think that's what I pulled uh, up. Like, look, there's, there's um, you know, classic works of art, modern art, the kind of art that we see in museums. Yeah, that can tell us stuff. That can be useful to study. That can be interesting. Although quite often it, it kind of falls into this high culture thing that's one thing that's driven me crazy it's and 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 the reason why i love cultural studies and the Stuart hall stuff when i was first learning geography anthropology as well there's so many books and articles where they to prove their point they describe some art exhibit at some you know art gallery in new york city right uh and it's like cool but i don't know that never really spoke to me and it was always their like proof of stuff with some Typically some wealthy established uh, artist who was, you know, trying to prove a point about something with whatever. And it's kind of like, yeah, it's interesting, but that's not really, it's not my life, right? But with cultural studies uh, and that aspect that I try to bring into this class, we have other stuff. Like on the right, look, we got Spider-Man there. Except, wait a second. Uh, is that Spider-Man? Wait a second. Spider Spider-Man's not black. Is he? Or not? Or what? That was a big deal. I remember tangentially i mean i don't know when i was a child spider-man was a white guy it was peter parker that's that's it um but in recent years 
we've had this idea of different spider men uh, and even spider women and, and all of that. Um, that that freaked people out. I don't know if you remember the backlash. Like the idea of between a black Spider-Man and a black Stormtrooper in those new Star Wars movies. Oh, a lot of people flipped out. By a lot of people, I mean a lot of racist white kids uh, and white young men flipped out over this stuff. But I mean, that's that's something. That's a lens into our culture, right? What's happening like today with Star Wars and Marvel movies and the DC movies and all like, like entertainment in general that comes from these comic books. That's incredible. An incredible site of study. Whether or not you like the movies or you know don't like them or whatever, it's irrelevant. It's what are these movies telling us about our culture, right? We can pull a lot out from the art that is produced that helps to, it's not just something pretty or fun to watch or whatever. It's helping to reinforce, in fact, if I go back here, traditions, language, beliefs, values, that kind of stuff, right? It's all, all this stuff is connected and how we watch them with the technology that we can stream this stuff now versus having to go to a theater where this stuff is is displayed on film and, and that kind of stuff. I mean, it's all connected. And with the art itself too, you know, we can, we can extend that into place itself, right? Where do we see this art? Where is it, it put up and in what form uh, and that kind of stuff. All right, but the key thing is it's not biological, Number one, you're not born with culture at all. Okay? It's just it's something you are you're exposed to and it becomes a part of you, but we kind of soak it in like a sponge as little babies and then toddlers and, and children. We're taking all this in. All right? That's like a survival mechanism. It's it's how humans are able to function. It's through culture. So we have that ability, but the actual cultural things themselves. It's all, you know, it's made up, uh, effectively, uh, in the sense that it's not biological, it's not natural, so if we humans have produced. And as such, it's a process, okay? It's something that changes. I don't know if you've seen this film, I think it was from, what, 2007, called The Darjeeling Limited. It's one of my favorite uh, films, mainly because of its, its cultural implications the idea is these three brothers travel to india to have some kind of spiritual awakening be able to connect on some new level and they go to india because it's india because it's this ancient mystical place like of course you're going to have a spiritual awakening in india because they treat it it goes back to like massey's idea of of space being replaced by time it's like these these people in india appear to exist thousands of years in the past when humans obviously were much more spiritual right and the whole idea not to give anything away but they don't have the spiritual awakening by going to these shrines and praying and all that stuff because because culture is something that changes right so in india even though there's this this ancient history that's there being in India in the year 2022, it's not like you're stepping back in time. You're just in India in the year 2022, right? All culture changes in every location. In this country, I mean, the way I've described culture changing is something that I've changed since I've started teaching. I used to talk about gay marriage. Like, you know, did you guys know that like some gay people want to get married, right? That was something that years ago, people were like, what, no way, weird. Now it's like, yeah, I've got like five gay married neighbors or whatever. That's like, that's standard, right? And it's the same thing if, if I were teaching this, you know, going back decades and decades ago, it'd be like, did you know that there are some black people that are married to, to white people? Um, you know, and people go like, what? Weird. Oh, no, that's an abomination. And, and now it's like, yeah, that's that's my family or, you know, whatever. You get what I'm saying? Uh, now, the whole like trans issues are a, uh, a big thing. Transgender issues and what is gender. Gender's such a complicated thing, even though it shouldn't be. But we'll, we'll talk about it. But I'll just, spoiler alert, gender, it's all made up. Um... And we know this. Now, there's there's biological sex, right? That's your actual 
genitalia, right? Male, female. And, and people will point out that what about, you know, people who are born hermaphrodites who are born with both types of genitalia and stuff like that? Like, okay, we have these exceptions here and there, but from the biological sex category, we have males and females. For the most part, we can get along with that. But gender, how we define this, how it's typically used, is, is how you behave. Like what it means to be male or female to you. And there have been a lot of studies on this. Judith Butler um, is, is kind of the, the main theorist. And, and her whole thing was that gender is performative. It's something we do. She points to uh, uh, drag queens. Right? where you can have men, biologically male men, and this isn't even like transgender men who identify as female or whatever. It's, it's the men who, quite often gay, but still men nonetheless, who just, they put on the show of being a woman, right? And, and can do so in a way where it's, it's quite convincing, right? That's the idea with gender, that it's this performative, it's what we do. All right, so like I am biologically male and my gender, I think of myself as male or a man or, or whatever, but it's just this masculine version of what it means to be a man that's connected to where I was born and, and the culture in which I grew up and, and all that stuff. If you go back in history, you can see that even in this country, right, in, in the United States, the idea of gender has changed dramatically. Like the idea of give, assigning gender to kids, that's a relatively new thing. Uh, that's, you know, 100-ish years old, right? It, before this, it was the case of, uh, um, you know, no, you don't do that. A kid's a kid. A kid isn't, you know, male or female. It's a kid. That, that was the thing. And then later on, as the child grows up, you start to treat them like a, you know, young man, young woman, or whatever. But kids are just kids. Okay, and that's how it was until it wasn't, and, and you know it gets into things like you know our consumerist society and and spending you know so much money on buying the blue clothes for your your blue baby and the pink clothes for your your little pink girl baby and and all that stuff. But all this stuff, it's all made up. It's all socially constructed, right? And it's things change. How we deal with gender changes quite a bit. Right, and I do love also we're we're cowards, and we don't actually talk about this stuff. I love the idea. These are from the Antelope Valley here, but the idea of you know all gender restroom, and then we always have somebody in a wheelchair in there, as if if you're in a wheelchair, you're not male or female, boy or girl, anything like that. You are just genderless, right? That's absurd, but it's a way. And like this one, it's like everybody uh, in here, but then we also have the floating wheelchair person right there. It's all. So stupid, but say lovey, right? Here we here we are. Um, a few things I'm not gonna dwell on all this stuff, um, too, with my examples that I would give in class, but just to kind of wrap it up here, I do want to say that when we're studying things and we're thinking about culture, we want to ask whose culture is is visible in this landscape we're reading, or in the situation that we're studying, or whatever. Who's the dominant culture? Who has power? And therefore, who is seen as normal, right? Or belongs in this area? Because quite often, there are examples where, yeah, you have one group that does belong, but then another group isn't welcome, right? For, for whatever reason. And it can be simple, um, uh, you know, ignorance, not aware that the way things are done doesn't quite work for everybody, in this situation, right? Uh, in other cases, it's a deliberate effort to exclude people. We'll talk race and segregation, like in the Jim Crow South. Um, we'll get into that, all separate but equal. Like clearly, there's a certain culture that was pushed to the side, right? Um, you know, we'll, we'll get into that uh, when we, we get into that stuff. But that's just something to think about. So I want my whole indigenous peoples thing. I'm not going to get into that right now. In the interest of time, um, this kind of stuff. Well, I'll, I'll leave you with this. Just something to think about. I'll show this image here on the screen. This was taken out of a, a, a magazine, actually, my South Lake Tahoe Hotel Room. 
years and years ago, back when when uh, marijuana was just it was medicinal in uh, California. But before we even referred to it as cannabis, which is kind of the way we we do it now, it was it was medical pot or or whatever medical marijuana. That was the the idea, and you would get stuff like this that would pop up. What I love about this, if you look at it. I mean, it doesn't say it doesn't say marijuana, it doesn't say drugs, anything like that, anywhere, right? You can't find that anywhere on here. Yet at the same time, it says it everywhere, right? Like there are all these little clues. It's always fun in class to discuss what are the clues with this, and really to figure out which one of you uh, uh, students are, are druggies and which one of you uh, are good, honest, uh, pure individuals right that's what i'm always looking for um with my students but yeah something to think about in there it's like whose culture is, is being expressed but also this gets back to this idea of of how we we know things based on culture what our culture tells us even if nothing is explicitly saying that thing you dig hopefully you dig all right that kind of wraps up this stuff and that'll keep you occupied um you know, for at least a part of this week where we're doing remote learning. So uh, best of luck with this stuff, geographers. Stay safe out there. Stay healthy uh, and all of that. And I will, uh, well, I'll, I'll talk to you later.